Chapter 6, A Box in the Closet It was strange how people didn't talk much about the blackout. Power failures usually arouse lively discussion, with clumps of people collecting on corners and saying to each other, Where were you when it happened? And what's the matter with electricians? We should kick them out and get new ones. And, and that kind of thing. This time it was just the opposite. When Lena went to work the next morning, the street was oddly silent. People walked quickly, their eyes on the ground. Those who did stop to talk spoke in low voices, then hurried on their way. That day, Lena carried the same message 12 times. All the messengers were carrying it. It was simply this, being passed from one person to another. Seven minutes. The power failure had been more than twice as long as any so far. Fear had settled over the city. Lena felt it like a cold chill. She understood now what Dune had been speaking about on assignment day. Ember was in a grave danger. The next day, a notice appeared on all city kiosks. Town meeting. All citizens are requested to assemble in Harkin Square at 6 p.m. tomorrow to receive important information. Mayor Lamander Cole. What kind of important information, Lena wondered. Good news or bad? She was impatient to hear it. The next day, people streamed into Harkin Square from all four directions, crowding together so close that each person hardly had room to move. Children sat on the shoulders of fathers. Short people tried to push forward toward the front. Lena spotted Lizzie and called a greeting to her. She saw Vindy Chance, too, who had brought her little brother. Lena had decided to leave Poppy at home with Granny. There was too much danger of losing her in a crowd like this. The town clock began to strike. Six vibrating bongs ran out. And a murmur of anticipation swept through the crowd. People stood on tiptoe, craning to see. The door of the gathering hall opened, and the mayor came out, flanked by two guards. One of the guards handed the mayor a megaphone, and the mayor began to speak. His voice came through the megaphone, both blurry and crackly. People of Ember, he said. He waited. The crowd fell silent, straining to hear. People of Ember, the mayor said again. He looked from side to side. The light glinted off his bald head. Our city has experienced some slight difficulties. Times like this require gresh presh fresh shawl. What did he say? People whispered urgently. What did he say? I couldn't hear him. Slight difficulties, someone said, requires great patience from us all. But I stand here today, the mayor went on, to reassure you. Difficult times will pass. We are making enough a rough. What? came the sharp whisper. What did he say? Those near the front passed word back. Making every effort, they said. Every effort. Louder, someone shouted. The mayor's voice blared through the megaphone louder, but even less clear. Worsh perushins, he said. Pank mush and pank. No urshin pank. We can't hear you, someone else yelled. Lena felt a stirring around her, a muttering. Someone pushed against her back, forcing her forward. He said we mustn't panic, someone said. He said panic is the worst possible thing. No reason to panic, he said. On the steps of the gathering hall, the two guards moved a little closer to the mayor. He raised the megaphone and spoke again. Solutions, he bellowed. Arbing phone. Solutions, the people in front called to the people in back. Solutions are being found, he said. What solutions, called a woman standing near Lena. People elsewhere in the crowd echoed what the woman had said. What solutions? What solutions? Their cry became a chorus, louder and louder. Again, Lena felt the pressure from behind as people moved forward toward the gathering hall. Jostling arms poked her. Bulky bodies bumped her and crushed her. Her heart began to pound. I have to get out of here, she thought. She started ducking beneath arms and darting into whatever space she could find, making her way toward the rear of the crowd. Noise was rising everywhere. The mayor's voice kept coming in blasts of incohum incomprehensible sound, and the people in the crowd were either shouting angrily or yelping in fear of being squashed. Someone stepped on Lena's foot, and her scarf was half yanked off. For a few seconds, she was afraid she was going to be trampled, but at last she struggled free and ran up to the steps of the school. From there, she saw that two guards were hustling the mayor back through the door of the gathering hall. The crowd roared, and a few people started hurling whatever they could find, pebbles, garbage, crumpled paper, and even their own hats. On the other side of the square, Dune and his father battled their way down Gilly Street. Move fast, his father said. We don't want to be caught up in this crowd. They crossed Broad Street and took the long way home, through the narrow lanes behind the school. Father, said Dune as they hurried along. The mayor is a fool, don't you think? For a moment, his father didn't answer. Then he said, he's in a tough spot, son. What would you have him do? Not lie, at least, Dune said. If he really has a solution, he should have told us. He shouldn't pretend he has solutions when he doesn't. Dune's father smiled. That would be a good start, he agreed. It makes me so angry the way he talks to us, said Dune. Dune's father put a hand on Dune's back and steered him toward the door. A great many things make you angry lately, he said. For good reason, said Dune. 
Maybe. The trouble with anger is it gets a hold of you, and then you aren't the master of yourself anymore. Anger is. Dune walked on silently. Inwardly, he groaned. He knew that his fa what his father was going to say, and he didn't feel like hearing it. And when anger is the boss, you get... I know, said Dune. Unintended consequences. That's right. Like hitting your father in the ear with a shoe heel. I didn't mean to. That's exactly my point. They walked on down Pibb Street. Dune shoved his hands into the pocket of his jacket and scowled at the sidewalk. Father doesn't even have a temper, he thought. He's as mild as a glass of water. He can't possibly understand. Lena was running. She had already dismissed the mayor's speech from her mind. She sped by people on Otterwell Street going back to their stores and overheard, sna overheard snatches of conversation as she passed. Expects us to believe, said one voice. He's just trying to keep us quiet, said another. Heading for disaster, said the third. All the voices shook with anger and fear. Lena didn't want to think about it. Her feet slapped the stones of the street. Her hair flew out behind her. She would go home. She would make hot potato soup for the three of them, and then she would take out her new pencils and draw. She climbed the stairs next to the yarn shop two at a time and burst through the door of the apartment. Something was on the floor just in front of her feet, and she tripped and fell down hard on her hands and knees. She stared. By the open closet door was a great pile of coats and boots and bags and boxes. Their contents all spilled out and tangled up. A thumping and rattling came from inside the closet. Granny? More thumps. Granny's head poked around the edge of the closet door. I should have looked in here a long time ago, she said. This is where it would be, of course. You should see what's in here. Lena gazed around her at the incredible mess. Into this closet had been packed the junk of decades, jammed into cardboard boxes, stuffed into old pillowcases and laundry bags, and heaped up in a pile so dense that you couldn't pull one thing out without pulling all the rest with it. The shelf above the coat rack was just as crammed as the space below, mostly with old clothes that were full of moth holes and eaten away by mildew. When she was younger, Lena had tried exploring in this closet, but she never got far. She pulled out an old scarf that would fall to pieces in her hands, or open a box that proved to be full of bent carpet tacks. Soon she'd shove everything back in and give up. But Granny was really doing the job right. She grunted and panted as she wrenched free the closet's pack in, packed in stuff and tossed it behind her. It was clear that she was having fun. As Lena watched, a bag of rags came tumbling out the door, and then an old brown shoe with no laces. Granny, said Lena, suddenly uneasy, where's the baby? Oh, she's here, came Granny's voice from the depths of the closet. She's been helping me. Lena got up from the floor and looked around. She soon spotted Poppy. She was sitting behind the couch in the midst of the clutter. In front of her was a small box made of something dark and shiny. It had a hinge lid, and the lid was open, hanging backward. Poppy, said Lena, let me see that. She stooped down. There was some sort of mechanism on the edge of the lid, a kind of lock, Lena thought. The box was beautifully made, but it had been damaged. There were dents and scratches in its hard, smooth surface. It looked as if it had been a container for something valuable. But the box was empty now. Lena picked it up and felt around in it to be sure. There was nothing inside at all. Was something in here? In this box, Poppy? Did you find something in here? But Poppy only chortled happily. She was chewing on some crumpled paper. She had paper in her hands, too, and was tearing it. Shreds of paper were strewn around her. Lena picked one up. It was covered with small, perfect printing. Remember to subscribe to hear what happens in Chapter 7.